The Chanting in the Woods I don't sleep with my window open anymore. No matter how hot outside it gets, that window stays closed. It's been this way for a long time, since I was very young. It's not a real hit with the ladies during the summertime. People usually recommend air conditioners, and I usually go with the prospect when I have the company. But when it's in, I don't usually sleep well at all because I can only imagine how easy it would be for anyone to bypass them. There is a single perk to the AC though, well, besides the relief from the hot stickiness of the summer's humidity, and that's the steady hum which stifles the silence. I don't like the silence, you see. There was a time when it brought me an almost zen-like level of peace and tranquility, but now I find it invasive, dangerous. Silence never comes alone. From time to time, I can still hear the chanting from my youth. I can hear them all, wordlessly and yet with prestigious synchronicity and harmony with one another. Their conjoined voices echo from the woods like the gentle and yet threatening breeze that precedes a violent hailstorm, rhythmic yet senseless. It never went away, and yet I know they've all moved on or died. I know this all very well. When I was about nine years old, my dad and I lived in this old rented two-family apartment house in the town called Bridgewater in the state of Massachusetts. We lived on the bottom floor. The second floor wasn't used. It was recently vacated by its prior residence. It was a very quiet neighborhood, very suburban with plenty of woods. Behind our house, there was a backyard that proceeded into a large forest that spanned it out for miles. I used to play in them. My dad and mother were recently divorced, so there were just the three of us living here. Me, him, and the dog, Cash, who was named after the late country singer, Johnny Cash. He was an old Scottish terrier, you know the type, ankle biters with these really ugly bearded faces. They got him as a pup when I was still in diapers, and he was a lifelong friend. He may have been something of an idiot, but at the time, he was all I had. I cried and cried when my mom tried to take him. In the end, he was left in my father's care, for my sake. Cash and I would spend a lot of time playing in the woods. When you're young, your imagination is a very powerful thing, and the woods had an almost magic quality in the terms of supplementation for my imagination. I would play army, build forts, climb trees. One time, me and Cash traveled so far in the woods, I actually got lost. We were losing daylight as it was October, and the light was fading at a much faster rate. I began to panic, afraid I'd be trapped out here in the pitch black. As we walked around, frantic for landmarks, anything familiar, that's when I saw it. The clearing, with a large rock in the center. It wasn't exactly uncommon to see graffiti and vandalism in the woods. A public forest is quite well known for trees with messages carved into them. Names, swastikas, Brad, and Jan forever and a nice cute heart. Stuff like that. Not to mention the pseudo gang names spray painted on rocks. That was my impression I got of this place. A hangout for older kids. But something wasn't right. Me being only nine, my mind wasn't exactly capable of comprehending the connotations of symbols and other things. And yet there was something really off about these images. I've never seen anything like them before. The surrounding trees had crudely shaped images of what appeared to be a goatman hybrid, like a stick figure with an unnecessarily detailed goat head imposed over where you would expect to see a very basic stick figure face. These images were drawn over and over and over again, all over the trees that surrounded the clearing, almost obsessively so, and not just the basic human height level, but all up the trees as if whoever carved them had to use a ladder. The rock itself had red markings all over it, letters that I've never seen before. Underneath, though, was written in black spray paint, a message I could actually read. It said, Behold the wisdom of the horned, and below that were five painted lines. They were all the same height except for the two outer lines that were twice the height and spiraled outwards at the top. What really scared me about this place, though, were the dolls. They were hanging from the branches around the clearing. They appeared to have been woven out of sticks, and poorly so. 
Taking a closer look, I realized what was so scary about them. While the sticks of the dolls were clearly constructed of the grace of crappy arts and craft students, the heads of them were drying clean skulls of animals. I don't know what of, but they were bleached white, dry, and clean. They're hollow sockets. I can't explain it effectively without sounding insane, but there was something sentient about them, watchful and pleading. I could feel their eyes on me, though they had none to watch with. I felt fear. Not my own fear, mind you, but something, an aura of emotion that made absolutely no sense. Have you ever been at an underage drinking party that got crashed by the police? It's that kind of fear. The fear that comes synonymously with trouble. I can't explain why I did it, but I reached up and touched one. Maybe it was a child's general inquisitive nature that compelled me. Maybe it was fascination or an intense desire to quell my fear and convince myself that they were just dolls and not watchful spirits I would eventually come to believe they were. When I touched it, the skull fell off. The doll unwound itself, only a piece of it remained attached to the rawhide rope that it was suspended from. The skull cracked when it hit the ground. When it happened, there was a certain quality that quelled inside me. As naive as my nine-year-old could be, there was also a certainty that remained with me to this day. I don't belong here. Cash immediately started barking when the doll fell. It startled me so effectively that I let out a scream. I looked up. The sky was glowing red with darkness not too far behind. The sun was going down and I had to get out of here. Cash was staring at me, black eyes wide open and tail wagging violently. He was barking at me insistently. He began to growl at something, maybe air, maybe ghosts. When I approached him, he turned and ran. Cash was my only companion in this unnatural place, and I would be darned if I was going to let him betray me into solitude here. So I gave chase. I ran for my life. The last thing I saw before I chased Cash was something that really messed with me. All the other dolls that were hanging when I first arrived were dangling. Some were even spinning lazily in the breeze. And yet as I ran after Cash, I saw every single doll on sight was completely stationary, staring and facing me directly. I was dismissive of this detail as I was more afraid of being alone. I never let Cash out of my sight. He led me straight home. I never loved my dog more than when I realized what he had done for me. Dogs are never lost. They always know their way. Before I went to bed, I told my dad what I saw. He laughed it off and told me that it was just teenagers being punks, and that I should let it go. I found it comforting and was almost willing to let it go. I even fell asleep without any trouble. That night was when I heard it for the first time, the noise that haunt me to this very day. I woke up and could hear noises coming through my window. I got up and looked out to listen closer. That's when I realized it was chanting. Voices. Dozens, maybe. They were coming from in the woods. I could hear them loudly and rhythmically. I don't know what they were saying, but I could tell it was ceremonious. Like a hymn you'd hear people sing in churches, except it felt dark, a violent even. I immediately thought about the clearing with the rock, the dolls, the fear. I knew in my bones that the chanting was coming from there. What scared me the most was that it wasn't far. It wasn't far at all. The chanting went on for hours. I just lied there in my bed, wide-eyed with fear listening to it, praying that it stop. It wouldn't, though. It went on until four in the morning when the early birds began to wake. I stopped playing in the woods. My dad noticed the behavior immediately and asked if I was all right. I told him about the chanting, and again he shrugged his shoulders and said it was probably some teenagers drinking beers and having a party. I asked him why they drink beer and chant the same sound for five hours. He told me that they weren't chanting, that I was just imagining it, and that I should close the window from now on. I probably should have listened to him, but I didn't. Curiosity got the better of me. The next night, the chanting began again at exactly 11 o'clock. It seemed louder than before. I couldn't sleep hearing it, but I couldn't bring myself to close the window. I don't know why I thought this way probably because I was just a child. 
I dimwittedly thought at the time that if I closed my window, I wouldn't be able to hear them coming if they decided to break into the house. The logic is flawed, I know, that they would still be chanting as they emerged from the woods and crossed my yard and not be nice and quiet about it. But that's how I thought back then. That's why I couldn't close the window because I had to know if they were coming. This went on for several days, every night from 11 to four, exactly on the dot. Sometimes I could see in the woods, way, way, way out there, a faint glow, like the light of a fire. But it was so faint and far in between that I didn't know whether to acknowledge it or dismiss it as a trick of my own eyes. Other times I would successfully fall asleep due to exhaustion, only to wake up several hours later in panic, still able to hear it. I asked my dad if Cash could sleep with me in my room on the third night, and he said it'd be fine. It felt better knowing that I had the dog to keep me company while I would hear the noise. And better yet, if I could hear them coming, he would too, then be a dog about it and start barking out the window at them. I anticipated a good night's sleep and felt even silly for not thinking about this solution earlier. I fell asleep at eight with Cash sleeping at the foot of my bed. I woke up a quarter past 11 to Cash barking. He was on his two hind legs, tail wagging spastically and he was barking out the window, ears pointing up, barking, growling, howling out the window. I immediately got out of bed and looked out the window towards the woods. Nothing, nothing at all. Cash was very agitated, growling and looking at me, then back out the window and barking. The chanting was still going on, same as the last couple of days. I remember feeling uncomfortable that Cash was barking at the noise, that if he was in danger of getting their attention. I tried to calm him down. That's when my dad came in. He stumbled in groggily and picked up the dog and turned to walk out the door with him, mumbling about shutting up. I called his name, but he was so asleep that he practically was dead on his feet. I screamed at him, Dad, the woods! That got his attention. He turned around and walked up to me, looked out the window, and then back at me. This again? He mumbled. Look, boy, it's just your imagination. No, listen, that's what Cash was going crazy about. There are people singing in the woods. Just listen. He looked carefully out the window. Cash was growling in his arms as he turned his head out the window. I listened too, but there was nothing. No sound. Total silence. I couldn't believe it. Could this have been a coincidence? My dad told me to go to sleep and left my room, mumbling insults at Cash. The silence chilled me far more than the chanting ever did. At least when they were singing their malicious hymns, there was at least a sense of distance between them and me. But right now, I know they're out there, but I don't know where. I had no bearing whatsoever. What was even worse, what wrought unprecedented terror upon me was that there was no nighttime ambience in those woods. No crickets. Evenings brought those things out in droves this time of year and even when they were chanting, I could still hear them. But now, it was quieter than a bone-chilling winter night. Pure silence. How long did I stare out that window, at those woods across my backyard? I have no idea. But when I woke up the next day, I was still sitting in the chair I planted right by it. That morning over breakfast, I insisted that there really was chanting out there, but my dad wasn't hearing any of it. He put his foot down and told me that he won't be hearing any more of this, that I needed to grow up and take responsibility and stop being so afraid all the time. You know, typical tough guy dad stuff. I didn't even bother to bring up the lack of crickets, knowing full well that he'd have made up an explanation for that as well, so I kept quiet and ate my breakfast. Later that day, I was waiting for my mom to pick me up at the end of my dad's driveway to bring me to my grandma's house where she was currently living. It was Friday and my mom had me on the weekends, as I was waiting, a large black pickup truck passed by the house, very slowly. It came to a stop right in front of me. There were two men in the truck, older, about my dad's age. At first, I thought maybe they were friends of his, but this thought didn't last. The driver rolled down his window and looked at me. He was bald and was wearing abnormally slim sunglasses. He was smoking a thin cigar, or a cigarillo. I remember the strong smell of it. He looked at me as if he was sizing me up investigating for a moment until finally he smiled at me, reached over and hit his friend on the shoulder and pointed me out to him. 
He too was bald and was wearing the same sunglasses. They said something to each other, and then the driver looked back at me with a terrible smile and drove away, waving slowly at me as he did so. They passed me by three more times before my mom finally picked me up. I didn't give those two any thought and just took comfort in the thought that I'd be sleeping somewhere else for the next couple of nights. The weekend went by without a hitch and sleeping over grandma's house was such a relief. When I told her and my mom about the voices in the woods, they just looked at each other and told me to tell my dad about it. Frustrated, I argued that I did, but it was pointless. She too used the, it's just your imagination crap, same as my dad. Not once during the whole experience did the memory leave my mind of the two men in the trunk or the distant chanting. Soon enough, I'd have to return. Sunday night came along and I was dropped back off at my dad's house, where I would spend the whole day dreading the inevitable nightfall, dreading the answer of whether or not I could hear the chanting in the woods, hear the strange people sing their dark songs in unison. I begged my dad to let me keep cash in my room with me tonight, but he said no leaving me to face whatever happened next, alone. So come bedtime, I was sitting in my chair by the window, staring out into the darkness until the hour came. I stayed up until 11, expecting to hear it, but what I got was silence. No singing, no crickets either, just pure silence. I couldn't tell if I was relieved or terrified. Maybe they all moved on. Maybe they went somewhere else to play their creepy games. It took some self-convincing, but... I managed to calm myself to such a state of mind where I could actually go to sleep, knowing that I was safe. Reluctantly, I crawled into my bed and closed my eyes. I woke up to the most chilling thing I'd ever seen. It was surreal, the image of it, every time I sleep. My brain immediately surged itself into full function, beyond consciousness and straight into full-fledged fight-or-flight mode as a cold, rough hand forced its way over my mouth and shoved my face into my own mattress. I felt a body much larger than mine bear down on me. I felt the jagged kneecap ram itself directly into my stomach, as I was then pulled out of my bed and wrestled into a standing position, the cold hand still holding my mouth shut. Another hand wedged my left hand directly behind my back, pulling me upwards until the pain became so unbearable, I thought my arm was going to come off. Shh. A voice whispered in my ear. His breath was ice cold. Yes, said another voice across the room. My eyes were well adjusted to the darkness, as it was, and I could see, through the moonlight shining into my now-opened window, a man wearing a horrible, horrible mask. At first, I thought he had the head of a goat, but I knew better. The goat stared with lifeless marbles where its eyes should have been. Its head was a mask made out of a severed head of a goat, or a ram, not properly stuffed and half rotten. Its horns curled into a spiral jetting out of its head, and random patches of fur were missing, simply to show raw blistering skin. I tried to scream, but the hand over my mouth tightened its grip. My arm behind my back pulled near breaking point. Scream, and we'll kill you, the voice whispered in my ears. My eyes couldn't. No, they wouldn't break away from that horrible person wearing the severed goat head as a mask. He was shirtless, wearing a necklace of what appeared to be bones. He was horribly emaciated, and there were markings all up and down his torso. In his right hand, he held a knife about the size of my forearm. Its build wasn't like any knife I'd ever seen. It took a step closer to me and pressed it up against my throat. The steel was bitterly cold, and the tip of the blade was sharper than anything I'd ever felt. It would take less than four ounces of pressure to open my throat, and they knew that I knew it. I couldn't cry. I couldn't even breathe. In its other hand, it held a basic candle. Tomorrow, the thing said, his voice muffled by the lifeless dead goat mask. You will exit your house at midnight. You will light this candle. Place it on the ground in the center of your yard, and you will sit behind it, legs crossed, right foot on top of your left knee, and vice versa. If you don't do this, the voice whispered into my ear, the blood of your loved ones will be on your hands. The goat man quickly retreated the blade from my neck. I don't remember what happened next. I remember waking up in my bed, panting and crying. My dad came in to see what was wrong with me, and when I told him, he told me it was just a nightmare. At this point, he sat down at the end of my bed. He looked very wary, like he didn't want to say what he was about to say. 
He rubbed his eyes with his fist and wearily explained to me that this was all just me stressing out over the divorce. That maybe we should look into talking to a therapist about these voices and hallucinations I've been having. I remember feeling so betrayed, so alone by the unfairness of that. I argued with him that everything I was seeing and hearing was true, but it was too late. He and mom talked it out, my behaviors, my claims. They think I was losing my stuff over the divorce. Their minds were made up. Nothing I was going to say would convince them otherwise. And of course, in hindsight, it only made perfect sense. Who would believe a nine-year-old when they said that they were hearing voices? I was silent the whole day. Cash sat with me in my room as I wasted the daylight playing video games. I didn't speak to my old man, not once. I could see the weary look on his face when he'd walk by my room, but he didn't want to press the issue. He looked just as defeated as I did. He spent most of his time on the phone. It wasn't until later that day I found myself recalling what the goat thing said to me before everything went dark, that I had to light a candle at midnight. But when I woke up that morning, there was nothing in my room. There was a sudden sense of hope because when I searched around my room trying to find his candle, it was nowhere to be found. Never. Even to this day have I searched so hard for something only to be frantically pleased by the end results. It was gone. Have I been alleviated from the duties imposed to me by these strange interlopers? The relief was unbelievable. Like I was severed from this horrible burden. Even the thought of being forced to see a shrink didn't seem so harsh compared to the prospect that maybe these attackers were really just a bad dream. A severely realistic dream, mind you. But a dream nevertheless. Maybe. Maybe the whole situation really was over. Maybe these horrible people did move on and that the goat man was simply a mental projection of my own imaginative expectation towards whatever it was those unnatural proceedings just beyond my sight were. You know, speculation. Nightfall came and for the first time in a week, I felt no fear at the prospect of it. That felt good, like things were going back to normal, but I was wrong. I was so wrong. When I placed my head on my pillow, eyes already closing, consciousness already drifting away. I felt a lump under my pillow. Curiously, I reached down there and felt something, something long and smooth. I pulled out a candle, a tall, thin wax candle with a nice, long wick. It was red, just like the one the goat man was holding. My heart sank, my mouth went dry, tears ran down my cheeks, and in that moment, I relived the entirety of that last night all over down to the very last detail, where the guy holding me whispered in my ear on how the blood of the loved ones would be on my hands. Suddenly, I was back in hell. I was back in the realm of terror. How did they get the candle under my pillow? Had I overlooked it this whole time? I lie in bed until midnight. I didn't dare close my eyes for fear of being held at knife point again, for the fear of coming face to face with that horrible goat creature. The night was silent. No crickets. No birds. Nothing. Dead silence. I could see that it had turned 12.01. The memory of the goat mask in my mind uttering its instructions to me over and over again. Go outside, light the candle, sit behind it. Do it or the blood of my loved ones will be on my hands. At the time, I didn't know what it meant to have the blood on your hands. The following day, I would learn exactly what it meant. Around 10 minutes in, I mustered up the courage to walk over to my window look out it. What I saw choked me on the spot. Side by side at the entrance of the woods, I saw men, shadowed by the night, standing side by side. There must have been twenty of them. None of them were saying anything. They were all dead silent, and I could feel their eyes on me. It was just as strong as when I felt the eyes of the dolls on my back at their side. In a way, they felt like the same presence, the same intelligence. I can't explain it. And then, I saw him. The goat man, or rather the silhouette of him, standing in the center of the figures. He was still, still as a stone, but I could make out the face shape, the jutting horns. I could make it all out. I chickened out. I couldn't go out there. I just couldn't. I hid in my bed, blankets over my head, and I shut my eyes tight, crying all night. I didn't fall asleep until I heard the early morning birds. I was awakened by 11.30. Shortly after breakfast, I heard my dad shouting in my front yard. I went out to check and see what was happening, what it was that had him so upset. 
As I went out the front door, I could hear him more clearly. I could hear pain in his voice. A knot formed in my throat, and a harrowing sensation crawled across my skin. I was not ready to learn about the events that transpired. And that was truly the scariest part, the moment before actualization. These people have mentioned blood on my hands. I didn't know what it meant, but I had a very vague idea that it meant my family getting hurt. I thought they got my dad. When I got to him, I saw that he was on his knees, crying. Cash was killed. He was hit by a car. There he laid. Goofy pointed ears, his absurd silly dog beard, black staring eyes, and a hanging tongue, stationary, forever. I saw that his center torso had been collapsed, and I could see his opening in his rear side, his ribs jetting out, his entrails. Son! My dad cried out as he turned to hug me. It's okay. He quickly led me back into the house, away from Cash's lifeless body, away from my best friend, dead and mutilated on the side of the road. The last thing I remember seeing as I was brought into the house was a large pickup truck, driving by slowly. I saw the same two bald men, as old as Dad, staring at me through oddly slim sunglasses. I saw blood on the front right tire, and I saw the driver point directly at me. Cash's death was my fault. As I said it out loud, my dad held me tight and said with a stone-cold certainty that it wasn't my fault, that sometimes things like this happen. He told me exactly what you would expect a father to tell his kid when their pet is killed in a random and seemingly pointless accident. But I knew better. The people in the woods killed Cash, and it was all because I didn't do what they said. It was because I was a coward. His blood was on my hands, just as they said it would be. When I went into my room to cry, I saw outside my window a man in the center of my backyard. A man with no shirt on. He was wearing a mask made out of the severed goat's head, hollowed out in the inside. In the daylight, it was far more disturbing to see, because I could almost smell the lack of sanitation it had to have exerted. I could see that it was surrounded by flies, but even worse than that, I saw a note it was holding up. A piece of paper with a single word written across it. Midnight. I couldn't handle it. I ran outside to chase him down, but when I got outside, it was gone. My hate and my anger somehow superseded my guilt and sadness because I ran far into the woods before realizing that this time if I got lost, I wouldn't have cash to lead me back to the house. I would be all alone. No, I would have whatever was with me out here. I could feel eyes in here. I could feel eyes everywhere. My every movement was being watched from the autumn canopy to the bushes just yards away. I knew I was surrounded in here, and as my senses came more clear from the adrenaline-fueled rage I was experiencing, I realized it was only getting stronger by the minute. Then I noticed the smell, the stench. At the time, I thought it smelled like bad milk or bologna left in the refrigerator for too long. It was strong, too strong. My eyes began to water, and I could feel my stomach begin to turn. How could a smell be so painful to endure? Then it occurred to me. They killed my best friend. There was only one more life they could take. My dad's. The presence became stronger. I could hear whispers in the wind. The smell grew more powerful with every breath. Any second, I was certain I would be overwhelmed by God knows what. I realized that if I didn't want to do what they demanded me, I would be taken here and now. What could I have done? I shook my head and began to cry. Okay, I'll do it. The relief was instantaneous. The woods became brighter, the smell gone, the feeling of being watched replaced by what could only be described as serene. The forest went from a den of unspeakable terror to a place of, well, it was just the woods again, just as it always was. I came back home and helped my dad dig Cash's grave. We said our goodbyes and buried him. He made up a cute dog bone shaped tombstone out of leftover wood from his old workshop and that was that. My mom came over that day and we all went out to dinner for food. The food was the best I'd ever had. We gave Cash a little toast and that was that. In the back of my mind, midnight, midnight. I spent another silent night staring at my clock Watching the numbers transform into the next every 60 seconds, the wait was agonizing. Each passing minute was like a minute removed from my life. That night, I was certain that I was going to die, 
and that I was trapped. They would have killed my parents if I tried anything. Killing Cash made that entirely too clear to me. 11.55, I looked out the window. There they all were, side by side, shadows of people and the goat man in the center. All their eyes were on me. I looked at the clock. Midnight. I looked back out the window. They were all gone. They knew that I knew that they were coming out tonight. They killed my dog and they threatened to kill me on the spot after I followed them into the woods. They knew I was broken. My spirits shattered and that I was more afraid of what would happen if I didn't come out over what happened if I did. I grabbed the candle and walked into my backyard. The darkness was thick, thicker than usual, and the smell. Sour milk, spoiled lunch meat, blood, rot, decay, crap, puke, bile, death. My skin began to crawl and a shiver took over me. Breathing became difficult. I could scarcely make out the forest before me. It wasn't just an entrance or a boundary. It was a living, breathing thing, and it was anticipating my every movement. As I took a step into my yard, a jolt of terror shot through me as I passed through the motion sensors and activated the backyard light. There was relief in light, safety at least, for a little while anyways. I used my father's lighter to spark up the candle. I planted it into the cold, dewy grass and sat down nice and slowly, ready to cross my legs. I never sat in the full position that I was instructed to because I was in the process of sitting down. I saw it. Two green eyes. Have you ever shined your light directly on an animal's face, way off in the distance in the dead of night? At a distance where it's too far to make out anything what it looks like, but not far enough for their eyes to not catch and reflect the light. This was exactly what I saw, except it seemed to be too high above the ground, higher than a coyote's height and higher even than a human's height. It appeared to be pacing back and forth. I could hear the leaves shuffling with each step it was taking, constantly coming in and out of existence due to the unseen trees eclipsing those glowing shards of light, those glaring eyes. They must have been reflecting off the backyard light I could hear it breathing. It sounded painful to me. The air came out in short, sporadic breaths, and when it did, I felt the huffs of frozen air rank with the rotten stench go right through me. I don't remember how long it paced like this, never leaving the outskirts of the woods, never breaking eye contact with me. Every now and then it would stop and lower closer to the ground until its eyes were level with mine. It would remain in that position like a cat low to the ground. Prepping to pounce on its prey, it would only stay in that position for 10 seconds at a time before it rise back up and pace more. After it did this several times, I realized something was stopping it. The light. I was dumbstruck, frozen in place. My throat was so tight the air was barely getting in me, barely getting out of me. There was a powerful sense etched into my soul that any sudden movement would have sent this unspeakable thing into a frenzy at me, light or not. I didn't know if it was going to outright kill me here in the backyard, or if it was going to drag me into the woods and eat me alive there. I don't know what the relationship was between this and the psychopaths that ordered me out here. What I did know was that each moment it wasn't getting me, it was getting madder. I couldn't let it get me. I couldn't let it take me away. Theoretically, I was safe in the light, Except the thing was that this motion sensor light ran on a timer. I knew that the timer would soon run out, and when it did, the light would go and nothing would stop it from getting me. With all my courage, all my willpower, I forced myself to stand up, letting out a hoarse breath. The eyes immediately stopped moving when it saw me stand. I couldn't tell you for certain, but I was almost positive they narrowed. The prospect of me escaping infuriated it to such a level that it began to stalk towards me. I could tell it was moving forward, threateningly, showing a willingness to brave the light. I took a step back and when I did, it took a swift step forward. I could almost see its shape, tall, thin, bony, too dark to distinguish any specific features, except, well, it had horns, large, curly, spiral-like horns, or at least it looked like it did. I don't remember running back to the house. I don't remember making it inside. 
I don't remember anything after the point where the light shut off. It was sudden, as if death had caught me. The timer was up. The light shut down and enveloped me in darkness, and I recall hearing it scream. It sounded like a child had denied its toy, or was that me? When the light died, I freaking ran. It was hours later when I came to my senses, my dad holding me, my mom was there too. I was crying. Later, they would tell me that I was screaming, don't let it get me, over and over again. Don't let it get me. I don't remember myself. I never saw that creature again, with the goat mask again. The two old men in the pickup truck, I never saw them again either. That day forward, I always slept with the window shut. The next day, my dad and my mom took me outside to explain that nothing had happened. We saw displaced grass mixed with mud. We even saw gore marks in the trees. I thought this would be evidence enough to plead my case, but it didn't. My dad immediately laughed at me, telling me that he figured out the whole thing. I had an encounter with the deer. Those markings in the tree were from the antlers, and it charged at me because it felt threatened. This was such a convenient explanation that I wished to God that it was true, but I knew otherwise. Several weeks later, I heard that there was a missing person search that took place in those woods, but I myself haven't seen nor heard anything at the time. My dad and my therapist insisted that this knowledge would only enable my tendencies as a schizophrenic, so they stopped me from looking into it. Yes, I was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia disorder. They said I got it through my inability to cope with the divorce. They told me that I had retracted into a delusion because I felt responsible for the family's collapse and that my youthful, undeveloped mind couldn't process the guilt properly. That these cultists and their beasts were just agents of my personal symbolism. Something like that. For a while, I believed everything they told me. The lies felt safe. The lies were comfortable. Several years later, they would tell me that I had made a full recovery. It was an easy process, since I never had another encounter again. At that point in time, I was so angry. I just told them what they wanted to hear. When I became old enough, I severed all ties with my parents, and I moved out of state. Once I was on my own, I looked into the town archives and researched as much information as I could about that era, when I was nine. The missing person report. The manhood in those woods lasted several days, and all they found was one man. He was torn apart, his limbs removed, his organs missing. They found that he was wearing a peculiar mask, the head of a ram, but its innards were carefully carved and hollowed to fit over a human's head. When they removed the helmet, they saw that he had died with the expression of absolute horror. I took pleasure in that. I would like to believe that these men were cultists, that they were attempting to appease some unseen, unnamed god, a god that absolutely should not have existed a god that had no right to walk among men. And during that process, their attempts to appease it, I had botched their ritual by breaking an important piece of the process, the doll, and in their attempt to salvage it, they forced me into offering myself up as a sacrifice to it, but it failed to do whatever it was going to do to me that night, destroying the whole operation. I would prefer to believe that in the name of vengeance, this angry thing turned on its own worshiper killing them all and dragging them back all to wherever it came from. It's the only thing that makes sense to me. There is just one thing I still couldn't figure out. Why is that, no matter where I go, when I'm all alone in the quiet place in the dead of night? Why can I still hear them chanting that unholy sermon that I heard so long ago in the woods when I was nine? Anansi's Goatman Story Here's my story. Be black and have family down in Alabama. They farm and own a huge amount of land down in Huntsville. Uncle owns a big house and a bunch of trailers they put out in the woods for hunting and camping. Down South Cousins suggest that we go out there to camp. No, I'm a city kid from Chicago, so they like to tease the freak out of me. Collect food, kill a pig and some chickens, and bring necessities to camp out for a few days. We get to the camp and it's obviously something weird. Air has this weird electric smell, like right before a storm, like ozone. We think nothing of it and unpack and go down to a little creek to swim for a few hours. All of a sudden, some older white guy and a white teenager comes out of the bushes. He has a shotgun in the crook of his arm and says hello and asks us what we're doing this far back in the woods. Tell him about my uncle, who he knows, and say we're out camping. He tells us that we need to be real careful out here 
and stick together when there's a big animal in the woods. His son, who is my age, asks if he can stay and hang out with us. He says okay. I'm going to stop green texting because the story is fairly long and the format is harder to write in. So we end up playing football, dicking around with me and this white kid, Tanner, five of my cousins and there's four of their friends. In total, there's five girls and six boys. We're all around 15 or 17 years old. We end up just dicking around that day. So we head back to camp and pull out some of the stuff for a campfire, even though the trailers both had kitchenettes. Tanner says that his family's property sits up against my uncle's. He wants to run home and ask his dad if he can come out camping with us. My cousin Rooster says he's going to go with them since it's going to get dark soon. One of the girls also wants to tag along. It's about 7 o'clock and it's starting to get pretty dark. They take flashlights and take the trail down towards Tanner's property. The rest of us chill. We make some s'mores, drink, and kiss on the girls. About 30 or 40 minutes later, there's a smell of ozone again. You could smell it over the smell of the fire we'd started. This really nasty, coppery smell like right after you had have a nosebleed and it stopped. It wasn't exactly like dried blood, but it was the nasty metallic back of your throat smell. We immediately think that it's some kind of electrical malfunction or someone left a hot plate on or something. We search the trailer and nothing is on and we can all smell it. All of a sudden we can hear people booking down the path towards us. Rooster, Tanner, and the girl all come running back into the clearing, out of breath, and they don't even break stride. They all run into the trailer right by where the fire is. We all get the freak out of there and into the trailers. They end up calming down, even Rooster is crying his eyes out at this point. All the while, the fire is guttering lower and lower. So my other cousins say freak it and are about to go outside to get the generator out of the shed between the trailers. Tanner goes, no, lock the front door. Ain't nobody else going outside. He's been crying too and his eyes are bloodshot and puffy and his pants are dirty. He goes on to tell us that when they went out to his house, his father said, sure, he could go camping, but make sure that we are careful on the way back and that maybe we should take one of the hunting rifles just in case. Evidently, Tanner had seen something in their yard a few days before. One of their pigs had come up, ripped up, and half eaten. They assumed it was just some of the big cats or coyotes, even though they don't usually mess with the live animals. He had gone upstairs and packed his stuff and told his dad that they'd be okay without the rifle because coyotes avoid people. So they started walking back towards where they were camping. Rooster finally stops crying and shaking. The girl already had, but she was just staring out the window with a dumb look on her face. He says that they'd gotten halfway into the woods towards the camp when they started to hear stuff in the forest. It was almost pitch black by this time, so they weren't sure at first what the F it was. The girl says that she heard something off in the bushes, right off the trail, and they beamed their flashlights over there, and there was something standing back in the woods in a little hollow. Rooster said that they shouted at him, and they told him that they were scaring them and that he was being a jerk. He says that's when they realized that the guy was facing away from them, so they kept walking. They started smelling this nasty coppery ozone smell. They see that they looked off in the forest on the opposite side, and the dude was standing in the forest, backwards, slightly closer to the path. So now they start power walking, and Tanner keeps going. I should have taken the freaking rifle. As they're telling the story, the smell is super strong, even inside the cabin. They say that after they started walking faster, a low gibbering had started coming from both sides of the woods. And as they started booking it back to the trailer, the girl said that she flashed her flashlight out into the woods to the side of them, and they'd seen something jerking itself through the woods. The gibbering just got louder and louder, and when they could see the light from our campfire, something had come out of the woods about 40 yards behind them onto the track, and they just flat out ran as hard as they could to the trailer. So we're out in the freaking woods and we're assuming at this point it's just some rednecks or something trying to mess with us. All of a sudden, my other cousin, Junior, starts going on about how he went to school with a native kid that was telling him about the goat man or something. We promptly tell him to shut up because we don't need that spooky talk right now. But he just keeps on going on and on about how it's the goat man and how we're out in his woods and blah blah blah. Now at this time, I've never heard of the goat man or any of that. But then a couple years ago, the year before I graduated from college, I had a menum for a roommate and I ended up asking him about it. And it sums it up. 
It's basically a man with the head of a goat, and he can shapeshift, and he can get among groups of people to terrorize them. It's also supposed to be kind of like a Wendigo, and it's bad mojo to even talk about it, or even worse, if you see it. Keep in mind, I don't know this back when I was 16, so my cousin is going. The goat man's going to get in, and he's going to get us. The girls are all terrified, and my cousin and I are just trying to figure out if it's some hillbillies or if it's an animal. So all of a sudden, the smell just goes away. Like to this day, I haven't even experienced anything like it. Like usually smells fade away or lessen. It just literally was there one second, and then not the second. So it's after an hour, making it around 9 or 10. We've stopped crapping bricks enough to go back outside and stoke the fire again. We figure out it's just some a-hole trying to mess with us, so we don't go back home. Because if we think we do, he'll chase us through the woods or something crazy. Nothing else weird happens that night, and we stay another night. And for the main part of the night, nothing happens. About 1 in the morning, we're going outside getting drunk and telling ghost stories. As someone is finishing the too spooky story, I don't remember what about, the smell comes back. It's so freaking strong that one of the girls literally start vomiting. I stand up and you can actually feel how clammy the air is. I say we should get inside that this isn't right. We should have just left. We all go back inside and we're standing around. My cousin just keeps going on and on how it's the goat man. My cousin Rooster tries to shut him up. And all the while I'm just feeling that something's wrong. And I can't figure out what the freak it is. We end up sitting there for a while. The smell is just as strong, and we're all terrified, all huddled in this little camper. We end up cooking brats for everyone because nobody wants to go outside. It's one of those packs with four brats. We have a total of three packs. I grill them up on the stove and give everyone a hot dog. I get mine. After a while, one of my cousins gets up and goes over to the pot to get another. He starts grumbling about how I got two brats and everyone else only got one. I look at him like he's stupid. I tell him that everyone only got one because there's only 12 brats. If he wants more, he should open up a new pack and cook some more. That's when the girl that had been out with Rooster and Tan just starts screaming. Oh no, oh no, get out! She's crying and shivering, and then it dawns on the cousin standing up what the F is wrong. Me and him both glance around the room and I start feeling my heart sink. I run the freak out of the cabin and the girls run out with us. The trailer door is banging against the side of the trailer as everyone books it out of the cabin. One of my cousins asks us what the freak is wrong. I start counting. There's only 11 of us now. I kid you not, my cousin verified. There had been 12 people in that cabin, but being that everyone didn't really know each other that well, nobody had really noticed that the whole freaking time that there was an extra person. And then I realized earlier that I kind of noticed something was off. You know how you're just joking around and having a good time, that you don't sweat the small stuff, and that you don't always keep track of certain stuff? I'm dead sure that someone else had been in the trailer with us, and that they'd been there for at least a freaking day, eating with us. What makes it worse is, I could figure out which one because I don't think anyone ever actually interacted with the other person, slash goat man. The girl kept praying to Jesus and we're all sitting outside. Eventually, we get these big sticks and go back in the cabin, but there's no one in there. We count again and there's 11 people. We go back into the trailer and lock the door. We explain what the freak just happened, and the girls say that she realized it too, and that's when we're about to say something. The person sitting next to her grabbed her leg hard and leaned over towards her and said something she couldn't understand. So we're pretty much scared as crap as we huddle together, and I fall asleep. When I wake up, the sun is just coming up and half the people are asleep, while the other half are packing our stuff up. We all want to walk back home, but like four people want to stay until the sun is all the way up. And some people think that we're just goofing around and still want to stay at the trailers. I just want to get the freak out of the woods. The girl's name is Kara, one that the goat man had touched. Anyway, I ask her if she really thinks it was something bad, and she said that she just wants to go home and she doesn't want to be out in the woods alone for another night. So we decide to split up. The four that want to go can go, but I have to stay because I have the keys to the cabin, and it's my uncle's, and I have to lock up. I'm super pissed at this point, because I feel like people aren't taking this stuff seriously, and I definitely didn't want to be out in the woods for another night. I spend the rest of the day trying to convince the rest of the people. Now four girls and four guys. 
to get the freak out of Dodge. Tanner leaves with them to go get a rifle and says he's going to be back, so there's just seven of us left by 4 p.m. At around 5 p.m., he hasn't made it back yet, and we're getting extremely antsy. The only reason I haven't stopped begging them to go back was because that he went to go get a gun. At about 5.30 or so, when one of the cousins that did stay say that the girl Kira is outside. We all look outside and sure enough, she's standing there by the fire pit, with her back to the cabin. And I'm thinking to myself, as she was so freaking scared, why the heck would he come back? And that's when I get this nasty feeling in my gut. Keep in mind the whole time the coppery smell has been gone. Now I realize I can smell just a twinge of it. I say this to the rest of them and everybody. And these are the people that wanted to stay in the freaking woods after we had the freaking go man in our midst. Everybody is laughing at me and asking if I set this up to scare them. I am looking at them like, I am not kidding any of you right now and I asked them why the freak would I play like that. So one of the girls goes outside to get Kira. She gets halfway there to her and she stops cold. Kira starts heaving. I don't know how the freak to describe it. Sort of like if someone with their back turned was laughing without actually making any sound. It was this fact that made me realize there was not one freaking sound in the whole woods. It was dead silent. This was like later in September, so it was still fairly hot at the time but it was also chilly some days too. You could usually hear some big geese honking or some kind of birds or squirrels chit-chatting. So I stepped out the door and tell her to come back in, right now. She backs up into the trailer and we lock the freaking door. We pull down all the shades except one and put a guy in a chair to watch her. She stands there for another 20 minutes or so. The guy turns to say that she's still there and there's a huge freaking bang on the door. We all jump the freak up and scramble around the living room of the trailer. The banging is super loud. So now my cousin is now holding one of the girls and the other two are kind of giggling with nervous laughter and me and the other two guys are just crapping bricks. Then we hear Tanner. He's screaming. Let me in! Stop playing around! So we all go over to the door and open it and he stumbles in with a rifle. There's nobody else outside. Evidently, he had walked up to the campsite Nothing weird happened in the forest, but he had seen a girl. Mind you, he said it was not Kira standing there. When he got into the edge of the clearing, she had turned towards him with a slack-jawed look and just stared him down, slowly tracking him as he walked around the outside of the clearing towards the camp. He said it wasn't until he was almost halfway to the trailer he had realized that she was getting closer to him. She started off by the fire, and without even seeing her move, she had been turning, inching, closer. He said that he just ran the rest of the way back to the cabin thinking it would open, and when he got to the door, it was locked. He turned and it was about half the distance to the door. He looks around the room and then gets super pale. He pulls me to the side and whispers in my ear, you know there's only seven of us in here, right? I get that feeling where your stomach drops to your nuts. It had been back inside the trailer while we were all sorting out who was going where and then when we all went outside to talk earlier in the day, it just slipped right back in. We looked out in the window and there was no one there, so we recounted everyone, and basically, I go over and ask how many people there were earlier, and everyone says, eight. I say, well, how many are here now? They all count and realize that there's only seven now in this cabin. So Tanner had brought back a couple boxes of ammo and his rifle, he had told his dad that there was some kind of animal out in the forest because he didn't think his dad would believe him if he said it was the goat man. He says that his cousin is supposed to be coming down in a few hours and that in the morning we can all go back to his place and his cousin will drive us home. Now I'm really freaking terrified but I feel better because we can be American and shoot the freak out of whatever it is if it comes back. But then my cousin gets into this huge argument with one of the girls because she thinks I'm trying to be funny and prank them and that she's really getting scared, and it's not funny. He keeps telling her, I'm not that kind of person, and she says, well, how do you know the girl wasn't just Tanner in a wig? Or, if this really is the goat man, how do we really know that this is the real Tanner, and that the goat man just didn't kill Tanner in the woods and take his gun? So we get into this huge argument about this, where me and Tanner are like, we could all seriously be in danger, because at the very least, someone has been sneaking themselves into our trailer without us knowing and mingling with us. 
And at worst, something bad is in the forest with us. One of the girls is crying and saying that she wants to go right now. We're trying to tell her that we shouldn't because none of us are walking through the woods in the middle of the night. At this point, the sun is starting to go down and it's getting a little cloudy out. We eat something and turn on the radio for a while, but we really can't get a good station out there with anything decent. So we turn it off about the time that Tanner Cousins shows up. He's like 19, I think. At this point, the sun is just barely over the horizon and he has one of those heavy duty lantern flashlights and another rifle. He walks up to the trailer and we whisper to Tanner, asking if he's sure that that's his cousin. And he says yes. The guy looks behind him and all around camp, then walks in. Kind of glances at all of us and looks a little confused. He says, where's your other little buddy at? I figure she would meet us up at the cabin. Is she a little slow or something? He also asked whether we'd been cooking blood in the cabin, because it smells like blood and hot pants were all the way up the trail. We were all like, nope, but we asked him what the freak he's talking about with the girl he saw. He had come down the same trail as Tanner had been using, and he'd come up on one of Yu's buddies standing out in the middle of the trail, looking at him slack-jawed. He had asked her a bunch of questions, but all she did was just look at him. Then she smiled at him, and he kept walking. She couldn't seem to keep up with him, and kept lagging behind him. He said he'd asked her if she was hurting or something and if she needed any help, but she just continued to stare. Eventually, he had been walking and turned around in a bend on the trail, but when he turned around and went back to see if she's okay, the trail was empty. He assumed that she had taken some kind of shortcut through the woods to get to our trailer. We tell him the whole story on what's been going on. I half expect him to say that we're full of crap, but he just listens and sat down on the couch in the living room. Tanner's cousin gets back to the girl, he says when she kept trying to lag behind him, it had kind of weirded him out, so he tried to keep her in front of him, but no matter how slow he walked, she was always lagging a little behind, and that's when he smelled this nasty smell, and it only got stronger as he got closer to camp. Eventually it got really strong. She had said something really low that he didn't catch, and when he had turned around, she had been right behind him, and he stepped back from her. It was at this point he asked her if she was okay, and if she wasn't, he would carry her back the rest of the way, and she just kept staring. He said that he reached out for her, as in to grab her on the shoulder, but he must have misjudged the distance, because she was off to the side of where he had put his hand, like she moved while he was looking dead at her. So at this point, we know that this stuff is real, unless Tanner is playing a joke, which we can tell he's not because he's almost pissing his pants. So they load up their rifles, we eat some more, and we kind of just sit around until 11. To this freaking day, every time I think about this, I pray to God that it's some huge prank that my cousins played on me, and just never revealed, so I would just crap myself for the rest of my life. At around 11, the stink of copper turns into an actually nasty, gross, blood-like smell, like cooking blood and singed hair. Tanner and his cousin Reese get the freak up and instantly grab their rifles. There's like half knocking, half clawing at the door, and I kid you not, there's this voice. And it sounds like when you see those YouTube videos of cats and dogs whose owners teach them how to talk. It says in this halting, weirdly toned voice, Let me in. Stop playing around. It made my freaking nuts creep up against my body, and one of the girls just start crying and calling on Jesus. It was so freakingly obvious that this was not a person. It didn't have the right cadence, and that's some of the stuff that I never realized until that moment. But all the people have a certain cadence when they talk, no matter what language. All people have a certain kind of rhythm when talking. This stuff doesn't have any kind of cadence or rhythm. It's one of those YouTube cats. That's what it sounds like outside the door. So now I'm in full terror mode. We keep yelling outside, Who is it? Stop messing around! It just kept saying, In. Let me in for about 15 minutes. It sounded like this, almost. Just not funny. Sorry for being on a tangent, but if you can't really imagine this stuff, then you can't imagine how effed up the whole situation was. So then the smell goes away for a while, and then for the next hour or so, you can hear someone basically creeping around in the woods and stuff. Every couple of minutes, it'll come back to the door and say something. Finally, when the smell fades away, it's around 2 in the morning right now, 
Reese says, man, forget this, and opens the door and walks outside with his rifle. He fires a shot into the air and says something to the effect of, in the name of Jesus Christ, go away, and he fires two more times, and then from the woods right up against the river across the trailer, it sounds like something is slowly gibbering and hooting. Then it starts screaming, and it sounds almost like a woman and a cat in a bag screaming together, like I've seriously never heard anything like that, and you can hear the brush over the way they start to shake. Reese fires over into the tree line, and then starts backing into the house. We lock the door, and you can hear the stuff keening and screaming. Reese says something had come out of the bushes, super low to the ground and crawling towards the cabin. He had shot at it. Pretty much that's how the rest of the night went. It was literally screaming constantly for the next two hours, and we could hear stuff moving out into the tree line. But it never came back up to the cabin until everyone had finally fallen asleep. Tanner had been sitting in a chair watching the door with his rifle. Nobody ever heard or saw this, and he told me two days later after the whole thing was over. He said he'd been nodding off after the screaming and noises finally stopped, and he'd been almost asleep when he saw someone come out of the bathroom and lay down in the middle of the floor and go to sleep. He just assumed it was one of us and had nodded off. He then said he kind of realized something was wrong, and while pretending to be asleep, he counted us. There were nine people in the cabin. He basically didn't want to try to shoot at the freaking thing in the cabin and have it kill us all then and there, or have Reese wake up and start shooting, and then we'd kill ourselves. So he just stayed awake all night, pretending to be asleep. He said sometimes it would stand up and kind of do this weird jittery thing, or heave like it was laughing, but then it would lay back down. The story closes pretty weak, because from my perspective, nothing happened. We woke up and I noticed that Tanner was a little bit jittery and that he was avoiding looking at all of us. But we ate some breakfast, packed up, and started walking to his house. He stayed last in the cabin and said he'd lock up and bring me my uncle's keys. He wanted us just to start walking and he'd catch up, something I really didn't want to do. We got a little bit up the path and when he came running up, basically we just jogged back to his house. His cousin took us home. There was a window in the bathroom. Tanner had gone back to lock it up and look in there. We were too stupid to lock a screenless window. The window was freaking up when he went in there. I'm guessing he'd been doing that all night, waiting for us to fall asleep or slip up and then getting in among us. It walked with us all the way back to the house. And then he sat, it lagged to the back of the group and looked at him dead in the eyes before walking into the woods. <laughs>